Hello everyone, welcome to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager and I'm going to be your host today. Today's sponsor of Textiles and Tea is Schiffer Publishing. They are a, a family owned business that produces everything nonfiction in books. If you're looking for a topic, I'm sure Schiffer has it. They have a variety of fiber books. So go check them out at SchifferBooks.com. We will take questions as always today. And just a reminder, please use the Q&A. We love your comments in the chat, but I won't see the question unless it's in Q&A. So thanks for doing that. Today, we are welcoming Justin Spazero. Now, just as weaving is so respected and sought after for his quality and structure and use of natural color, but Justin's work is more about just weaving. He celebrates the natural world and cares about the dignity of human labor, echoing a time when our towels, our covers, everything were handcrafted. Justin strives to connect material with maker, with user across time and space. His venture, called the Burles Garrett, draws on the textile traditions of his northern Vermont home. Justin examines the role of handcrafted in a post-industrial society, questioning the human experience in our digital age. Welcome, Justin. We're glad to have you here. It worked. Great. Uh, hi, Kathy. It's great to be here and everyone Good. else. Thanks for having me. Well, the first question is the most important. What is your favorite tea? Gin. Uh, but uh, before noon, I'll stick with PG tips. Do what? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just keep you guessing. Uh, What's my mug right now? Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so how'd you get started in fiber? How'd you get started in weaving? Um, so I'll, I'll try to keep this as brief as possible, because I could go on for too long. Uh, but my, uh, my grandmother spun, wove, knit, uh, dyed, embroidered, sewed, I mean, sort of anything fiber and textile related. And um, my earliest memories of her all involve wool in one way or another. Um, so growing up, it all seems sort of um, commonplace. Um, uh, my mom's side of the family also was one of these uh, Yankee families that came over in the 1630s and hasn't thrown anything out yet. And uh, so there's just a lot of old stuff around. And uh, one of those things that ended up in our house was uh, a great wheel from probably the 18th century. And uh, so my grandmother taught me how to spin on that when I was uh, about 12 years old and got interested in weaving shortly after. Well, um, can you tell us a little bit about the Burroughs Garrett? How um, did that come about? Sure. Well, oh boy, huh? Um, <laughs> I uh, so I I've gotten interested in weaving and gotten my first loom uh, by the time I was sixteen, and it's, it's actually one that I still use today. And um, was sort of self-taught and kind of messed around with it a little bit. Um, had a few books, made fabric, but um, my technique wasn't very good at all. And um, I went on to work in museums for a while, and through that I learned of Norman Kennedy and Kate Smith and sent Kate an email and trained with Kate Norman for um, a few winters and eventually ended up working for Kate uh, in her fabric business, uh, Eaton Hill Textile Works. So I worked for Kate for a number of years, uh, weaving fabric for her, and then um, started my own thing in, uh, I think, 2017, officially. Um, so that's sort of how, how that came to be. It's, uh, it's very much tied to my house, so I, um, moved to this particular house in Newbury, Vermont in uh, 2016. And um, this is also um, the kind of place where no one's ever thrown anything away. And uh, up here in the, uh, the garret, what you might call an attic nowadays, um, was all sorts of uh, 19th century textile equipment, including uh, warping bars and spools and broken parts of a treadle wheel and uh, a loom even all up here. So. Um, it just seemed natural to sort of link my business with the place because the two of them are, are so entwined. So all that equipment was left there when you bought the house, it was waiting for you, right? Just sitting here, yeah. I mean, there's some stuff missing, so I haven't, haven't put the loom together yet, but, um, <laughs> but it's just waiting for me. 
Will you talk about how you do reenact? You don't do reenactment, that you do reproduction. And then we have a picture of you here at the loom doing a um, reproduction of a, um, I believe that's a picture in a book, right? And then you, you made it into actual cloth. So what is the difference between the two and why is reproduction so important to you? Um, so I get, yeah, so let's see, it, it's all very, you know, complicated philosophical stuff, but um, <laughs> the, uh, I guess, well, I'll talk about the, the pictures first and then I, maybe that'll help launch into <laughs> the rest of it. Um, this is a, a photo of one of the first winters that I was um, training with Kate Smith and Norman Kennedy. Uh, we, Kate and I, set out to reproduce uh, a piece of fabric that um, is pictured in a uh, facsimile of a sample book that was kept by um, a guy in Sweden in the 18th century. He uh, just compiled fabric samples, basically kind of anything that you could buy um, in the mid 18th century. He, he put a little scrap of it in this book, uh, which has been uh, beautifully preserved. And, you know, because all these textiles sat inside of a book, you know, they haven't faded at all. You know, it's had no light damage. Um, they're really incredible. And uh, so the book was uh, photographed and uh, a reprint sort of uh, made. And, uh, and with that also, they uh, included detailed notes about uh, the, um, the number of yarns in an inch and you know, uh, any structural information that they could glean uh, from them. So, so we set out to reproduce one of these fabrics called Kalamanko, which was woven in uh, Norwich, England in the 18th century. And if, so if you look, at the photo on the right, you can see all these little strips of all these stripes. And the last one in the book is butted up against our um, recreation of that piece of fabric uh, that's all naturally dyed, um, handwoven satin, and then uh, a, a worsted satin. And then it was glazed in a heated metal, uh, or using heated metal plates in a press to give it a glossy finish. Um, so, so that's one example of the kind of work that we were doing to recreate these fabrics uh, in a large, um, one of the reasons for doing that is that we don't know a whole lot about how they were made. Um, a lot of that stuff is sort of um, lost. It's not recorded in, in words anywhere. And so, you know, you don't know what you know, or you don't know how much you know about something or don't know about it until you try to recreate that thing. You know, uh, that particular um, piece of fabric had something like almost 40, I think, individual colors in it to get those gradations. And you know, these are little details that we would have no idea if we hadn't tried to study it so much to, to make a copy of it. Um, but I like to make the distinction between like reenactment and what I do. Um, like I don't do what I do just because that's the way it was done at some particular point in time. Um, I do what I do as a way of, of reconnecting with the um, textile making tradition that I was trained in and that used to be practiced here and that nearly sort of disappeared in the 20th century. Um, so it's more about sort of working within a um, sort of a, a type, a cultural kind of framework, rather than just doing it because that's the way somebody else did at one point. <laughs> that makes sense. Well, this may be, you may have answered this question, but let me do like a little devil's advocate here. Sure. If you had to choose, okay, yeah. if you do the cloth this way, it will be a better cloth, structurally better. But if you weave it this way, it will be more historically correct. Which way would you go? It's never come up before. <laughs> um, for, to, uh, to a large degree, um, uh, I'm, I'm partly joking, but um, uh, the, the textiles that I spent a lot of time looking at and thinking about uh, ones from the 18th and the early 19th centuries, um, you know, these were woven when hand weaving was sort of at its peak, um, certainly here in America, um, before the power loom replaced it. And so uh, the ways that cloth were made were incredibly efficient and um, practical and sensible. And um, so to a large degree, uh, by doing it in the older, the sort of traditional way, you end up with um, either a method of working that is, um, I think, superior, um, uh, or and or end up with a product that, that also, I think, meets those. Criteria. I mean, that being said, I mean, you know, I use I use end delivery shuttles all the time. Um, that's a piece of technology that has existed since the 1730s. So it's not like it's a new thing. Um, 
but people didn't usually throw them by hand. You know, they were just used as fly shuttles historically. So, you know, that's a thing that I do that's a little bit different than what people used to. But, um, but by and large, I, I found that by um, really digging into the way that cloth used to be made, um, there's, there's so much wisdom and knowledge accumulated there that, that in many ways we just have kind of forgotten about. Well, we're going to talk more about that whole thing in a few minutes, but um, now you sell as well as do commissions, right? So do you go out and find the people that you think will buy what you make? Or do you find a group of people that you think you can make something and sell it to them? Does that make sense? Yeah, yep. Yeah, I do. Um, I do a little bit of both. And in that way, I think I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> very firmly rooted in the, the tradition of um, sort of rural uh, hand weavers uh, as they have done for centuries. Um, if somebody has got a project in mind and it's something that I can do um, and get in touch with me and contact me, then I will usually do it and uh, come up with some way of, of making that work. Um, I, and my business was almost entirely commission-based um, initially. And fortunately in, uh, I think it was the summer of 2019, I started dabbling with um, online, like direct retail sales through my website, making some things that I just thought um, I liked a lot. And if I liked them, maybe somebody else would too and would purchase them. And uh, it turned out to be a lifesaver because it, you know, it sort of got established right before the pandemic hit. And at that point, nobody was commissioning, you know, fancy fabric for um, a museum interior or, you know, this uh, special project, you know, those things kind of dried up a little bit, but, uh, but the direct sales, uh, picked up, caught up, picked up the slack. Uh, so a little bit of both. I'm open to any way that somebody would like to give me money for what I do. <laughs> well, there are some perks for working for yourself, I understand. And like when you work for yourself, you decide your schedule to a certain extent, right? So there are probably days that you, you work hard, you're on task, work, work, work. And there's probably days that you kind of blow it off and go do something else. And then there may be another day where it's squirrel and you go down a rabbit hole and kind of explore something else. And when I was thinking about this question, I started to ask, how do you stay focused? But then I realized, well, I think, you tell me, all of those things are important. So how do you manage them? <laughs> yeah, poorly. <laughs> I manage them. If anybody out there is a uh, product manager, uh, you know, get in touch. Um, I, I mean, you're hitting on a, a, you know, something that I think that's pretty near and dear to me I, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so many people used to, you know, work for themselves or be self-employed in some way. It really wasn't until industrialization that that so many uh, people um, kind of broke up their lives and separated those from their work. You know, people used to work from home all the time. And you look at an area like where I live here in rural Vermont that up until quite recently was so dependent on agriculture for its economy. And um, everybody worked from home because that's where, you know, your home is where you farmed and, and all this stuff happens at the same place. Um, so I think, you know, for me, all these things, you know, relate together. Um, that being said, uh, it can be challenging to meet deadlines um, or even try to plan sometimes when, when you know, the pig is sick and we have to call them the vet and deal with whatever's going on. So like that throws whatever else was planned out the window or, you know, the garden's behind or, you know, we're dealing right now that there's some mystery going on with the, the pipe that takes the water from the spring into our house. And so we're still trying to figure out like why the water sometimes slows to a trickle, you know, and that can be an all day thing, tinkering around trying to figure out, you know, what's up with that. So, um, so that is tricky. And um, I, I'm slowly, starting to accept that that the kind of our conventional standard modern ways of thinking about productivity just don't mesh with that system and I have to just sort of embrace that a little bit more and uh, yeah not not worry too much about it I love that <laughs> well um, when I weave I want to relax it's my recreation it's my time that kind of thing I cannot imagine after being at the loom all day long, that you would go weave to relax. So what do you do to relax? Um, 
I am I am surprised like remarkably boring in that way like you know Netflix has been great over the winter uh <laughs> we're catching up on on seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race that we missed when they first came out you know just <laughs> that kind of you know conventional ordinary stuff uh but but you're right yeah it's it's tricky I know I have very few projects of my own um that I really dedicate any time to uh these days kind of fit them in every now and then in between but uh when i look at the loom i often yeah don't see relaxation it's often like ugh, this thing that i should have gotten done a month ago that you know really need to <laughs> hustle on but well you mentioned earlier that we're kind of jumping back here that yeah. you studied and worked with norman kennedy and kate smith and that's a picture of them together um so would you talk some about who they were, kind of introduce them to the folks who may not know who they are, and then just share with us how they influenced you as an artist and the work that you do. Yeah, um, whew, try to boil this one down too into, <laughs> into a- um, An hour, don't worry about it. Time. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, we, we have until five, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so, so Norman Kennedy uh, was born in 1933 in Aberdeen, Scotland, and um, took a keen interest in uh, traditional things, um, music, sort of what we'd call folkways nowadays, um, and uh, particularly textile making. And so Norman learned textile making from a lot of, um, and the last of the rural practitioners and professionals that he encountered in post-war Scotland. Um, he then came to the United States in the 1960s uh, to St. Newport Folk Festival. And the short version of the story is that he basically never left. And um, in the mid 1970s, he founded the Marshfield School of Weaving, which is up here in Marshfield, Vermont. Uh, Kate Smith came uh, to the weaving school as a student in 1979 and she also basically never left and studied with Norman for um, over decades, uh, taught with him. And uh, when the weaving school closed in 1992, she founded her own textile business, which is Eaton Hill Textile Works, which is the, the company I was talking about before that I, that I worked for. Um, and, and Eaton Hill really specializes in recreating fabrics, especially from the 18th century. And she does it all using historic tools and, and techniques. And so this was all like right up my alley as somebody who was interested in history and um, old things and the old, old ways of doing stuff. And um, so being able to work and um, work with both of them and study and learn from both of them um, provides this direct connection to a weaving tradition that reaches back to the Middle Ages in Britain. Um, it's the same weaving tradition, you know, that was brought to New England um, through British colonization, and it's really not what you find being done anymore um, in most conventional, you know, contemporary hand weaving circles. Um, and so, you know, the, the techniques that we use and the tools that we use, these things I mean, go, go right back. You know, I, I could show you images from the 14th century of people using the same tools the same way that we do today. Um, and so it's this incredible privilege uh, to have learned from them and still work with them. I, I um, teach alongside Kate now at the Marshfield School of Weaving. Um, Norman's still, still there um, critiquing uh, as is his way. Um, and so both a great privilege to, to be the next you know, gener generation in this line, you know, this sort of chain that goes back for so, so long. Um, and also has given me a chance to learn these techniques and tools the way that they have been taught and learned for centuries, you know, one-on-one -on -one with somebody for a long period of time. Um, you know, in many ways, one of the greatest gifts that Kate gave me was just employing me <laughs> and paying me to weave fabric for her. And so I, you know, just sat at a loom for just day after day after day um, weaving. And, you know, there's, there's so much you learn just by, by being there um, that you can't replicate in any other way. So, so yeah, they've been a hugely important influence on me and it's, it's really been great in the last um, year or two to start getting into teaching more and to start um, passing that on um, the same way that they've given it to me, so. Yeah, did you say Marshfield is or is not still open? Uh, Kate, so Kate Smith reopened it in 2007. So the Marshfield School- Okay, I thought so, okay, all right. All right. It sort of closed for a 15 year period there, but, uh, but back in, um, as strong as ever, 
And um, I highly encourage everybody to check out their website, marshfieldschoolofweaving.com, I think, and, and check out the classes. And you teach there, right? You said I do. That? Yeah, if it's your first time, I will teach you in my class. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm dying to hear the answer to this because I, I saw this, I don't know, in another interview or online or something where you said that um, weaving has been muddled, quote unquote muddled, by the American craft revival in the late 1800s. I would love to hear you talk about that. Are we? Are you talking about the arts and crafts movement? Um, yeah, and well, and just sort of, um, you know, hand weaving went from being this thing that that was um, done domestically um, for household consumption and you know, like neighborhood mm -hmm. trade and that sort of thing, and also professionally. Um, with uh, the advent of the power loom, you know, that that really fell by the wayside, and then hand weaving was kind of revived in the late nineteenth and, and throughout the twentieth centuries. And um, so much information that had been, you know, just transferred person to person for so long uh, disappeared, really, or was forgotten, or people didn't know where to find it, or maybe didn't care. I don't have those answers, especially. I haven't studied the 20th century, um, you know, weaving revivals, but, um, but there, you know, are some real fundamental, well, I mean, for one, the tools and techniques, quite different. <laughs> Um, you know, these, these old hand looms. So I use looms that a lot of people would call barn loom. Um, I don't, cause that's not what they were called when they were, um, you know, new, um, and not what they meant to anybody, um, uh, during their sort of period of significance. But, um, you know, these things are built for the human body. They're, they're bigger than modern looms deliberately. Um, they're, they're much more, I think, much more ergonomic and flexible. Um, oh, okay. The, um, you know, I'm, I'm six foot tall. And if you were to put me in front of like a modern, like sort of standard loom, like I can't get in there, my legs stick out. Like it's really, you know, like trying to climb in, but you can't, you know, these looms are, are big, you know, I can get right in there, um, do what needs doing. Um, so, so that's one, one aspect. The, uh, the ways of working are quite different. Again, the, the, the tradition is quite efficient. It's focused highly on efficiency and, um, so, you know, when you start reading 20th century um, weaving books, ones from like the early to mid 20th century, you know, there are things, I forget, I forget where it is. I think it's, maybe it's Mary Atwater. I can't remember if it's Atwater or Black says in one of her books that you, you must have a loom with um, a sectional warp beam because there's no way to make a chained warp with more than one warp end at a time, which is fundamentally not true. And that's not the way that anybody ever did it before. <laughs> She was talking about it, it's just that nobody ever showed her how to do it. And so she had no idea there was a way to do it um, using a lot of ends all at once, which is what we've been doing for at least 700 years um, uh, in, in the West. And so it's all these sort of little things that sort of just got lost. And because nobody knew where to look for them, I guess, I mean, there wasn't Google, so I don't blame them <laughs> for not, not knowing where to look. I mean, I don't know where you start exactly, but um, so that's different. And, and you know, to me, um, I feel like, hand weaving used to mean a like a mastery of tool a mastery of technique and a mastery of material and um i don't feel like i find that very often anymore in a lot of places um so so those things are very you know very important to me there's you know all sort of terminology that sort of changed and got kind of messed with and and words now don't mean what they used to mean and we've lost a lot of <laughs> our weaving vocabulary um in the last hundred years so um, so I'm particularly interested in understanding more about what that looked like before that sort of happened and, and trying to kind of reconnect, as I, I've been saying repeatedly, uh, <laughs> reconnecting with that tradition and kind of working within that framework. I think there's a book in your future. If, um, if Schiffer Publishing is, uh, is listening, if you're watching, <laughs> you're here to find me. You're, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> um, well, talking about your loom, um, you have a loom that's pretty rare. Um, we've got some pictures of it here. And this is uh, a jacquard head, right, that you found and you put on the loom? Am I saying um, that? Right, yeah. I mean, the head kind of found me. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, so the machine, it's, it's the, the cast iron thing that's up in the, you know, on the top of the loom. Um, so it's a jacquard head, a jacquard machine. It dates to about 1860. Um, it's, it's an English made um, machine and it was um, 
purchased from a linen damask weaver in Scotland uh, by a guy named uh, Roy Orr, who used to live in Ohio. And um, he was captivated by them um, when he saw this guy Ian Dale weaving over in Scotland and was um, persistent, I guess, and persuasive enough to convince Ian to sell him one of these machines and um, have it shipped to the United States. And he had it set up for weaving uh, figured coverlets in the sort of 19th century American style. And um, I was talking ad nauseum with anybody who would care to listen about how I was trying to find one of these machines somewhere, anywhere. And um, uh, mentioned that to Becky Ashenden of Bob Stuga in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts. And um, Roy had taken a class from her. And so she knew about the uh, jacquard. And he was at a point where he was um, thinking about downsizing and, and passing it on to somebody else. And so the stars all kind of aligned just right. And, um, and now it lives up in my house. <laughs> now, I struggle to use a can opener. So I don't understand any of this, but it, it just looks so complicated. How did you figure it out, how it works? Because it's not like they were, like you said, you didn't have Google. There wasn't one on every corner. Right. Yeah, well, um, so the, the first and most helpful part was that uh, Roy had it all set up and working. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Oh, okay. So the real key was just to like not mess up what uh, what was there, and I did a couple times. I tried tinkering with it and um, discovered that I could not make improvements on uh, on what had been done, and had to put everything right back the way that he had it. But um, so uh, so that was one key piece of the of the puzzle. But um, I spent a lot of time looking at nineteenth century weaving books, and uh, and that's one place where the internet has just been you know such a godsend. Uh, because all these, well, not all these books, but so many books now are digitized and available free online. You know, you just download the PDF. And, um, and so a lot of uh, sort of third, third and fourth quarter 19th century books on jacquard weaving, you know, they're very technical and very clear um, in, in what they're trying to convey. And um, so it's been through, through those books an awful lot that, that I've troubleshot my way through all of this. Unfortunately, you know, Roy is still open to um, dealing with my questions when something goes horribly wrong and I can shoot him a text and he will lead me, uh, lead me back onto the path. Well, you're my hero. That, that's, that's a lot of initiative on your part to, to pursue that. that. That's amazing. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's a super um, cool machine. So it's worth putting up with. <laughs> Um, I saw an interview one time, it wasn't you, it was somebody else, and the, the interviewer asked the artist, is what you do impractical? I thought that was an amazing question, <laughs> among other things, amazing. How would you respond to something like that? Um, well, first, I, I would um, want them to define uh, what is practical, or what practical means, exactly. Uh, <laughs> You know, there's so many things that we think of as being like practical or inevitable or whatever, and you know, in the in the process of um, pursuing those, we lose something else. You know, I, and I think you know, this is uh, I think of Amish communities in some ways, um, not because I'm myself heading that path, but um, you know, the the just the conscious idea of of thinking about technology or a change in one's life and and weighing all of the pros and cons about that before just sort of welcoming it in. Um, I think if I was aware of how much time I spend on my phone every day <laughs> uh, before I got it, you know, 10 years ago or, you know, got a cell phone 10 years ago, I maybe would have made a different choice. Um, but it's sort of one of those things where like, I, I can't get rid of it now. Like, you know, too much of my business and the rest of my life is sort of enmeshed with the thing. And so, um, I think one just really has to like consider your priorities and what what um, what purpose does it serve or what what end are you are you going for? Um, you know, to me, I mean, like this loom that's behind me. So the jacquard is, is mounted on top of this loom, and the loom itself is from uh, it's an 18th century loom from Connecticut, and it's a beautiful loom, and it yes. mostly works for my purposes. It mostly meshes with the jacquard, but it's not a perfect match. Um, 
you know, the, the jacquard was not meant to be on a loom quite like this, and this loom was not meant to work quite like it needs to with that jacquard. And so I spent an awful lot of time doing impractical things um, to keep using this loom with this head because, you know, so far it's the best fit together and because I care so much about the tools and, and um, you know, the loom behind me would not be getting used at all, um, you know, if, if, if it wasn't for um, the work that I'm doing on it now or that somebody else might be doing on it. And so um, it's worth putting up with some of its um, impracticalities uh, because it means that the thing's gonna be here for another 50 years or 75 or, you know, till I'm done with it. So, um, so yes, my life is hugely impractical and I love it. And I highly recommend all the rest of you to be more impractical. <laughs> <clears throat> well, let's talk more about practical and impractical as far as dyeing, because you also dye your cloth. And we have some images of um, some of your yarn outside your studio. Um, so, and I always wonder when people die, do their own dyeing, why do you dye? What is it that you enjoy about it? And then if you could also talk about, um, I think you grow some of the dye stuff, right? I, I've just started to. Uh -huh. My matter is not established yet enough to actually start, <laughs> start digging up. And right now, matter is the only thing I've got going on. Uh, so my, um, my house hadn't been lived in for close to 25 years before I moved into it. And um, so the land was in kind of a sorry state. So it's taken a while to like get it to be productive again. So we're at a point now where I'm starting to um, put in things like dye plants. So, um, so stay tuned for more of that down the road. Um, so as far as dyeing goes, um, if I do any dyeing, it's just with natural dyes. Um, I'm not opposed to working with a commercially dyed yarn if it meets what a client needs for their project, but so often the colors available in the yarn that you know I need for the job just doesn't work. So those two things don't go together. Um, and I do work for historic sites too. And some of those historic sites really care about making sure that the, the dye that is being used, you know, that everything is as accurate as we can make to what things used to be. Um, and that has a, you know, a big long-term impact because everything fades. Like, I don't care what you dye it with, you know, the sun is powerful <laughs> and um, it damages things. And, you know, colors are gonna change over time. And at least if it's the same dyes that were being used in the past, it's gonna to fade to a color that would have been seen in the past, whereas a lot of synthetic um, dyes don't do that. And I've seen some real stinkers over time where you see a, a, you know, a synthetic dye that just, whoo, you know, looks awful um, after 20 years of sun damage. So, um, so that to me is, I think, you know, a, a worthwhile thing um, to, to consider. I personally work with natural dyes, both for, um, sort of health and safety, you know, I, I like knowing exactly what I'm working with as opposed to a lot of the proprietary stuff you get, you know, from, from a synthetic dye house. Um, but also because I want there to still be a reason to grow these plants and, you know, harvest these minerals and insects. And um, if my work can in some way support somebody growing, you know, indigo over in India, then great, awesome. I'd much rather support that than um, a lab making a synthetic version. Um, so that's a big part of it. I would say I'm a total hack when it comes to dying. I mean, there are people who, you know, really dedicate their whole lives and study to natural dying. Um, and my hat is off to all of them. Uh, I, I can sort of muddle my way through and usually get a decent color, but, um, but my experience and my training is, is relatively basic in that regard. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's so exciting every time you pull some yarn out and it works. It's not as exciting when it doesn't work. <laughs> It's not the color you wanted, or you, you know, you Price. forgot the bottom and it, yeah, burnt a little bit and the colors are off. Now. But uh, yeah, when, when it all goes together, I mean, you know, it's, there's nothing quite as exciting as pulling out some yarn and, and getting, getting what you wanted. Well, talking about supplies, um, I was listening to you on a, another program and you, you talked at length about the yarn that you required. Um, you were very clear about what you were looking for and what you needed. And it was more complicated than, oh, I think I'll do a 10-2 instead of an 8-2 kind of thing. So could you talk some about how you choose your yarn and what, why is it so specific for you? Um, I mean, the, the first part is just like everybody else, I am uh, 
stuck with what is available on the market and you know being somebody who produces in the grand scheme of things produces hardly any fabric at all you know i don't have the buying power of of a major mill who can get whatever they want you know um but there used to be uh, a much more diverse range of materials available to people hand weaving you know we just don't have the kind of variety of materials anymore and um that really you know i mean when you look at all of these old fabrics and again i'm, I'm saying old and i'm saying historic but you could also substitute traditional <laughs> in there too if you want but um there was so much more distinction by region and and the fabrics themselves were so unique um the, the types of, you know, and, and beyond just like structures, but we're talking the materials themselves were different from place to place. And that even like shows up in their, their names. So many old fabric names are corruptions of the place that was famous for making them. Um, and so the fibers themselves, you know, are the first sort of building block of whatever your finished fabric is gonna be. And then the way you prepare them is the next one and how it's spun and then how you work with them on the loom all those things combined to create what the character of the finished cloth is like. And if you start, if you, or if you don't pay attention to them or you, you don't um, maintain those differences, the fabrics all start looking alike. Um, and, you know, at one point, I kind of had the realization a few years ago that like, we're <laughs> I was just looking at a lot of other people and like, we're all using the same yarn from the same suppliers. And I mean, I like supporting people who make good yarn, but um, but there's a certain sameness that happens because if we all have the same size of the same material to work with, um, there's only so much distinction you can start to make, and it just loses some of its um, some of its character. So I work with a lot of singles yarns um, when I can get them. Uh, traditionally and even today, really, if you start like looking at the clothes you're wearing really closely, you'll see that an awful lot of the fabrics that we use in our lives. Um, are made out of a singles yarn. And so it gives a very different um, quality to the fabric than you get with a plied yarn. Um, I've been trying to work with more local material, but um, that's been sort of a, a, a tough road to hoe uh, when I, I think probably people purchasing for me are, are purchasing for other reasons um, and finding the right materials and, and the cost and all of that. but. Um, but I'm moving that direction as much as I can. Um, so yeah, I don't know without getting like specific project by projects, I would just say that, you know, the yarn is the very first place that your fabric starts. And um, so the difference between a woolen yarn versus a worsted, and if you can actually find a real worsted as opposed to a semi worsted, which is I think pretty much all that's on the market now. Um, and a singles versus applied, <laughs> you know, all those things, you know, and, and a singles cotton as opposed to applied cotton and, and how that changes your fabric. Um, it's all, uh, uh, where am I going with this? Try it. That's where I'm, I'm gonna stop blathering and just say, everybody try more yarns, <laughs> different, you different types and see what they do. Cause you might be surprised by the results you get. Well, Justin, we got a boatload of questions. So let's go to one our, some of the questions that we have for you, okay? Great. Um, somebody wanted more information about the book that you showed at the beginning with the samples. Is that uh, something that people can see somewhere or buy or? I don't know if it's still in print. It's um, the, the guy who was the collector, his name was Anders Birch. Uh -huh. And um, it was reprinted in um, a Swedish and English volume. And I don't remember exactly what the title is, but if you search Anders Birch sample book, online, I'm sure you can pull it up. It's probably, I hate to say it, it's, it probably costs an arm and a leg, um, but there might be a library um, okay. to get it. Um, Paula Williams wants to know, have you ever encountered a historical pattern or technique that was difficult or impossible to reproduce? Um, certainly a lot of difficult stuff. I mean, I wouldn't say anything's impossible. It just depends on like what, what you're trained in. I mean, that's one of the things that like, you know, I'm kind of a generalist. And people historically tended to be specialists. So, you know, there were branches of weaving where people often focused, you know, their entire careers in, you know, and there were people who like wove worsteds and never ever wove anything else, like their entire lives. They just wove this particular type of fabric and they were really good at it. Um, so there's a huge amount of, of training and embodied skill that like is, is hard to find nowadays. Um, I think probably the most 
complicated thing that I worked on was reproducing some coach lace, which is, uh, so lace is the historic name for what we'd often call ribbon nowadays. Um, so like narrow woven goods. And um, coach lace is a type of uh, lace specifically woven for trimming coaches. And then it was used for early automobiles also, because they, you know, just upholster them the same way that they've been doing carriages um, before that. And those things tend to be incredibly complicated. Um, and this thing was like, had a, you know, a, like a flat woven center section and then had double woven like little tubes on the outside edge that gave it um, strength. Yeah, and it was really hard to tell from the original piece that we had to look at like exactly how that was made and what was going on. So spent a lot of time with the pick glass and the graph paper figuring that one out. Um, yeah. Um, a couple of people wanna know how to, a jacquard loom works. I think I would encourage them, is that someplace like you can Google it and watch it, like a, some kind of video to see how it works? Um, the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum has okay. a really great um, little video on YouTube that has a little like computerized thing. If you go to my website, uh -huh. um, I have a link to it, I'm pretty sure, um, on the Jacquard pages, so you can check that out. Okay. Um, it's cool. It's not... Once you understand how it works, it's like not as exciting as it seems. <laughs> it seems really cool. And I mean, it still is cool. But then once you once you see how the rabbit comes out of the hat, you're like, oh, it's a rabbit in the hat. It's, you know, sure. <laughs> um, Fazia Rizdi, probably pronounced your name wrong. Sorry. What kind of classes are you going to be teaching? Um, so I am teaching what we are calling the foundations class at the Marshfield School of Weaving. And so that class is for anybody who is new to the weaving school, um, regardless of your experience level. So, so brand new, you know, I just taught um, a class last week and we had um, half the class had never ever um, been at a loom before, woven anything except for like construction paper in first grade. And then um, we also had somebody in that class who has been weaving for like 20 or 30 years. And um, the, it's an introduction to sort of the, the fundamentals of the way that this tradition approaches textile making and the projects are scalable. So you make sort of one of two options, but the materials that you work with um, can range. So if you're brand new, you can work with some nice forgiving cotton or um, wool. If you are feeling like you want more of a challenge, we can work with um, singles linen um, or singles wool. So um, something for everybody there. So I teach that class and then I'm teaching a class specifically on singles linen um, in the fall and also helping out with um, the resurrection of the original course from the weaving school. If you went to the Marshfield School of Weaving in the 70s or 80s, you showed up for six weeks and you were presented with a grain sack of raw fleece. And your first project was to hand card, span and weave that into a full size blanket. Um, wow. And so that, yeah, that experience is really just like the epitome of what um, what we do there and kind of what Norman has um, learned, preserved, and now passed on. And so um, we've decided to resurrect that again in the fall. So I'll be in and out. I won't be there the whole month because I've got my own stuff I've got to keep, keep doing here. Um, but uh, yeah, doing that. Well, this is interesting. This is from Joan McKenzie. She goes, I had the privilege of being able to do a demo weaving on a similar loom. We called it an in-grain carpet loom which has a jacquard style head at the Ontario Science Center in Ontario, uh, Toronto, Ontario. I'm wondering where do you get your cards for your patterns and do you make your own? Cause she said they have problems getting the right kind of paper for the cards. Um, she's looking forward to getting back to that. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm incredibly jealous. And one of these days um, uh, I would like you to sneak me in because um, John Campbell's loom is, is kind of the Rosetta Stone. Um, it's the only complete um, loom that was used for weaving these figured coverlets that survives. Um, there's a head, there's a, there's a figuring head in Pennsylvania that survives with cards, but no, no loom with it. And there are some surviving cards in some other places, but um, Campbell's is the only one where the whole thing is intact and we know what he wove on it because um, his coverlets survive and his account book survives. I mean, it's like everything you want to know is right there. Um, so super cool. Um, I punch my own cards. So fortunately, um, the head was purchased with um, a piano cutter, a piano punch. Um, so that's the, the special tool used for punching the cards in a quick, 
an efficient manner. Um, prior to that, you had like a template that would have uh, like a metal block and you would go through hole by hole and whack out the, the holes yourself. So that was a little more, a little more tedious. Um, the head came with some stock that came from Scotland, which was great. And I actually adapted um, Campbell's Rose and Stars pattern. So you may have woven that design <laughs> at uh, the Science Center. Um, I adapted that one and punched those cards. And then I started this next one that I'm working on right now and used up the last of the good card stock. And I am also um, without a supply of good card stock. You know, nobody who uses manual cards anymore uses punch cards. I shouldn't nobody, but like anybody who's still using them really shifted to Mylar a while ago. So the people stopped making the card stock and then everybody's gone digital, you know, beyond that. So um, I believe the closest thing to the good stuff, like the really good stuff, is a hard board for book binding. For what? Uh, I'm sorry. For book binding, or it's used for book binding a lot. It's used oh, for okay. making covers. Right, right, right. um, it's about a millimeter thick, and it's um, very fine grained and super strong. And the problem is, it costs an arm and a leg. So I've been using some cheaper pasteboard, which is probably an awful lot like what the 19th century um, weavers were using. They probably just had to replace it more often. Um, but uh, I'm on the hunt. So if anybody has like a, a box. Or a case of old cardstock, or know where it is, um, send it to me. <laughs> well, Tony Amon said the family heirloom weavers in Red Lion, Pennsylvania, has a jacquard head and old card cutter or punch. So, Tony, yeah. contact yeah. Justin. Justin, I got in touch with family heirloom weavers, and they said they've stopped doing that sort of stuff and didn't have any cardstock. Oh, but. But if anybody has a has an in with them and, and thinks they might have some in a shed they don't know about. <laughs> we know where it should go. You know, I'll give it a good home, I promise. Um, what base yarns, yarn sources do you prefer for dyeing weaving with? That was from Miss L. O'Neill. Um, you know, varies hugely. Um, I will say, I have to give a little shout out to my Rhode Island roots. Um, anybody who's familiar with Peter Patches in Central Falls, the Mill End outlet, um, uh, I've found some incredible stuff uh, through him. Um, you know, some beautiful linen from a company that shut down 20, 30 years ago or something, you know, just in a, in a case someplace and, and stuff like that. But, um, but otherwise, I purchased most of my linen and cotton from the Georgia Yarn Company. Um, Michael there has been really great about being able to source, you know, odd stuff that I've needed, and, um, including singles, cottons, and um, all sorts of sizes of linen. Um, so that's been really great. Um, for wool, um, Peter Patches, <laughs> one, one source, uh, Jagger Spun has a nice worsted that I use for certain things. Um, Knoll Yarn in England makes a you know really beautiful woolen yarn um but uh with the uh, through the weaving school and through kate we've had stuff custom spun at green mountain spinnery um so kind of little things anywhere <laughs> if i can you know somebody's got a yarn that looks like it might work i'm, I'm happy to give it a whirl and uh, use it well, how long does it take you to set up a new project on the loom i know there's a variety of factors involved in that but yeah, um, so so with the coverlets, the warp is all the same. It's uh, there's a a cotton warp, there's like a heavy warp and a fine warp, and they're they're wound as one chain. And um, I, in, you know, in that case, I'll put on fifty yards at a time because it never changes <laughs> from coverlet to coverlet. So that usually takes me a couple of days to get the warp wound, get it wound on, and then tie on the new one. And that partly is just because, um, again, this loom is not was not meant to be doing what it's doing. It was a very, very good sort of common ordinary loom. And now I'm making it do this fancy figured stuff. And so on uh, those um, figuring looms, usually the warp beam comes off and you can take it someplace else to wind. Um, and this one, it's trapped in the back posts. And so it doesn't go anywhere. And then it's also like underneath the rafters of my roof. And so it's hard to get um, in front and behind it. And you know, the, the Jacquard harness and all that doesn't go anywhere. I gotta like hoist that out of the way. So it's kind of a, a, a hot mess a little bit, which is why it takes me as long as it does. But um, but um, to give you some idea of how long it can take you to um, put on a warp in the way that we do it, 
the students who take that foundations class, I talk at them for the entire first half of the first day. They start making their warps and have their warps completely finished um, within the afternoon of that day. And then the next day they're beamed on and mostly drawn in and um, slagging their reeds and are weaving by, you know, by the third day. Um, and these are people who have never ever sat at a loom before. So um, quite quickly is, is the best I can give you. <laughs> it varies, I don't know. <laughs> um, we have someone asking, you weave a lot of textiles with thousands of warp ends. What is your process for warping your loom? You kind of talked about that. And what kinds of equipment do you use in that process? Um, so, so traditionally, um, warps were wound using multiple ends. So um, mm -hmm. when I first learned to weave, I just had a few books and probably like most of us listening to this right now, I had, you know, one cone of yarn, mm -hmm. one strand, and I went down, you know, pegs and back, you know, and you'd spend like, you know, days <laughs> making a warp. And it was, you know, it's no wonder everybody hates it. Like, it's awful. That's a terrible, terrible thing to be doing. <laughs> and, um, and then I went to um, Marshfield and learned from Kate Norman and found out that nobody ever wound a warp that way before like 1900. Um, people used to use a lot of ends all at once. And so um, I'll usually get my yarn in skeins. I'm one of those weavers who actually doesn't want their yarn in cones because if I have to dye it, I've got to skein it off, um, you know, and reel it off. So that's an extra step. And also if I've got to divide it up on spools for making a warp, it's a lot easier to do that if I'm working from skeins that are all the same size um, to begin with. So I'll spool it. And then that goes onto a scarn or creel or bank or scallop, lots of different names for it. But it's um, this rack basically with two tiers that you put all those spools onto. And then I wind mine on a set of warping bars um, as opposed to a warping mill, which would be the other option um, traditionally. Uh, it's the same tool that most people today call a warping board, except a warping board is actually a board with pegs that stick out of it, not a frame. That is a set of warping bars. This is another one of those places where the terminology got kind of dumped and forgotten about. But uh, so anyway, so I'll wind that warp, uh, uh, you know, wind in a few chains, take the chains off. Um, traditionally, uh, these looms are all um, warps back to front. So it's then beamed on using a rattle to spread it out. And then at that point, um, we set in some temporary sticks and lash the shafts of the harness onto those and then draw in the warp. So that is the rough overview. Come to Marshfield, I'll show you how it's done. <laughs> so are your classes, this beginning class, is that a week long? Yes. Okay. Yep. There you go, y'all. A lot yeah. of these questions we're getting today, <laughs> take his class. He's take class. That's pretty great, I think. You know, I'm biased, but. <laughs> We like that though. Um, you must have a large collection of hand woven coverlets. This is from Carolyn Burwell. Um, are, you, are there some that you especially treasure? Um, I have four coverlets, <laughs> four antique coverlets. Uh, <laughs> two of them I found at an antique shop that were being sold for like pillows or something. And they're, um, they're float work and they are, um, not super exciting, um, beautiful in their own right. You know, there's a huge amount of time, you know, that went into making them, but they're, they're not particularly exciting um, in their uh, patterns. And then I have two figured coverlets and, um, and I, I treasure those um, because of their sort of connection. So one of them, I found one of John Campbell's coverlets and it's in the pattern that I weave. Um, unfortunately, it has been hacked up and then somebody threw it in a washing machine. And so they just felted it and, um, it's, it's dimensions now compared to the ones that are still in museums are 17 inches smaller in their width and something, yeah, which tells you how much that wool felted. <laughs> oh. And then in the process, the cotton just shattered. So it's like mostly falling apart. Um, and I probably paid too much for it, for its condition, but, um, his coverlets don't show up all that often. And so when I saw it on eBay, I snagged it. Um, so well, I got that it at all. Yeah, it, it at least won't get abused anymore. <laughs> From here on out, and um, and then the other one is a uh, uh, coverlet woven in the agriculture and manufacturers design, which you can see much more about on my website. Um, and that particular coverlet was woven in 1830, and that is like in actually really great condition. And I kind of scored when I found that one, and so um, that one, yeah, is kind of my prize, little prize possession. It's a beautiful thing, woven full width, 
you know, uh, in 1830 on this, you know, loom that was um, at least 80 inches wide or maybe 90. Um, an incredible thing, double cloth. It's just beautiful. So if people have comments they need homes for, you know, hit me up. <laughs> Janice is asking, and this is a good question. I'm curious about this too, is how do you design? Do you use software to design or do you just draw it out by hand? All on paper. There you go. The only software I use is the, the free graph paper generator online to get the grid the size that I want it and then print out, you know, a bunch of sheets on regular old letter, like, you know, letter size paper, and then sit down with it. I personally like, um, there's that tactile thing about just using your hand and a good pencil and just sitting down and um, I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm fine with computers. And, you know, I, I think I have like a basic competency of anybody that like my age should have, but uh -huh. beyond that, like, um, that's like software and that kind of like drafting and all that is so different from the kind of the way the tradition exists that I was taught. Like I, I've been thinking about it. It's kind of the difference between like book weaving and like hand weaving or like hand and like head weaving. Um, there was no focus on drafting the way I was taught. There was none in the way that Norman was taught. And so he didn't teach it either to Kate and um, much more of a focus on seeing a piece of fabric and understanding its structure from a kind of like the yarn, the level of the yarn, but not thinking of it in terms of how you put it on paper or how you translate that paper, huh. you know, and, um, and so much of that, you know, you kind of see when you work with old drafts, um, all sorts of people have found all sorts of efficient ways of notating um, a woven structure. And um, it is not in the kind of fully developed, developed is not quite the right way, but like, explicit way that we're used to with modern drafting, um, which takes a lot of time if you don't have a computer program, in my opinion. So yeah, I did, I had to, I had to do actually a drawdown for a sample I submitted to my, um, to the complex weavers study group that I um, am a part of. And um, I just did like a tiny little bit of it because as I was doing it, I was like, this is for birds. This is like, oh my gosh. So much of it, like there's this fabric sample. It's right there. Just look at the cloth. Like, Thanks, sign up for this. <laughs> Well, um, I had just heard from our editor of our magazine who said that um, there is an article in the Shuttle Spindle and Die Pot magazine from, um, it's issue 194 from the summer of 2018 about the engineer who brought the Campbell loom back to life, including the punch card. So if you all want more information, um, check out that article in um, issue 194 of Shuttle Spindle and Die Pot. Um, there are so many more questions and we are out of time. Could people go on your website and email you or send you questions that they would like to have uh, more information about? Sure, yeah, on the, my website or um, if you're on Instagram, I'm at the Burroughs Garrett, um, find okay. me there. Um, I try to um, post interesting thought provoking things and, and have a little bit of discussion. It's part of why I spend so much time on my phone and not getting anything done. Yeah, uh, but it's fun connecting with. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. You're not playing video games or something. That's great. Thank you so much for being here today, Justin. This has been fascinating. I just, I love the history of, of what we do. It's wonderful. Um, and like he said, if you want more information about what Justin does and to see his beautiful images, he has wonderful photographs on his website and there's all kinds of information and links please go to his website site, which is theburlsgarrett.com. Be sure you put the in there and put an S on Burles, theburlsgarrett.com. Um, again, I wanna thank uh, Schiffer Publishing for sponsoring Textiles and Tea today. If you're looking for any book on weaving and fiber, they have a bunch. Let's cross our fingers that the next one down the pike will be Justin's book <laughs> and the history of weaving or anything else he wants to talk about. Uh, we would love to see that. But if you um, are looking for any kind of book on it, any information, I tell you, they have it. They have everything. It's amazing. Schifferbooks.com. If you would like to sponsor Textiles and Tea or your business or your guild, please go to our website and get more information. And that is at weavespindie.org. Textiles and Tea is sponsored by the generous donations to the Fiber Trust. If you like this kind of programming, you'd like to see more programming, please go online and join or donate or both. Um, and that information is again at weavespindie.org. 
If you missed part of this episode today, and I can see going back and watching this again, there was just so much information, or you want to share it with a friend, or just have a watching party on Tuesday, you all the textiles and tea episodes are recorded, and they are on the HTA Facebook page. You can go there and watch them. You do not have to have a Facebook account to watch it. You can just go on and, and pull up the episode you'd like to watch. Some more information about viewing. Um, we now can have a thousand people on our uh, Zoom account. We're very excited about that. That happened today. Um, so you can sign in now and get on through Zoom if you would rather do that than Facebook. The other thing is um, you can see these on YouTube, on the Hand Weavers Guild of America YouTube channel. We're just now able to get those up on the YouTube channel. I encourage you to go on and sign up for um, the YouTube because you'll get a notice every time an episode is uploaded to YouTube. So we're trying to get a thousand subscribers. So go to our YouTube channel and subscribe and you can keep track of all the textiles and tea episodes. Um, thank you all for being here today. It was wonderful. Again, thank you, Justin. It was great hearing everything. Hope you all have a wonderful week. Next Tuesday, we are going to talk with Jessica Pinsky. She's out of Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, an interesting story how she started an art center. So thank you all so much. Have a great week. Happy tea.